Hey everybody, if you're getting for NaNoWriMo, I wanted to let you know about a little class I'm teaching on the Speakeasy platform. I'll be teaching NaNoWriMo Boot Camp on Tuesday, October 12th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can sign up at speakeasy.com. Come in and hang out and let's talk about NaNoWriMo. But I've only got 50,000 words to go before the end of NaNoWriMo. I know I'm a little bit behind the times, but the YA ratings have to be talked about. And they have to be talked about in the lens of John Milton. This is the Ditch Diggers, uh, episode 22. I think it's 22. I meant to look that up. Ditch Digger, here, and ain't no wannabes here. With some not so nice advice for your writing career, to be clear. No punches will be pulled, but the punch may be spiked. How they like before they get on the mic. To my left, we got the mighty Mer Lafferty. And if I piss her off, believe me, she'll come after me. And her co-host, Matt Evan Wallace, on the right. Yes, she may be half as hype, but she can take him in a fight. So settle in, folks, buckle in and boot up. Time to meddle in a way to make your writer shut up. It's hard work, but the perk is that it's fun and exciting. Facebook will still be there when you're done writing. Ditch diggers! So, coming to you live from the social isolation booth uh, in our secret Ditch Diggers Manor, it is the Ditch Diggers with Mer Lafferty, and Matt can't be with us today. Matt is unfortunately taking a step back from the podcast again. Um, life comes at you, you know? It's, it's, it's come at me, and I'm a little discombobulated, but I'm working to put get everything under control again. My name is Mer Lafferty. I think I already said that, but I am a writer. I, you know, since I moved to Twitch, I actually haven't pointed out that I am a published writer who's, you know, a lot of people do writing podcasts or shows or blogs or whatever, and they have not been, they don't have uh, credentials. And not that that's bad. I'm just saying, I never say that I do. So, um, I have written, uh, Hugo and Nebula nominated uh, science fiction. I have written a Star Wars novelization and uh, several little things. My most recent thing is Godmaker, which is an adventure race you can run on the Zombies Run app. Zombies Run app is free. The Godmaker uh, series adventure is the first two episodes are free. So you can even check it out if you want for free. So this is the Ditch Diggers, where we talk about business. Don't talk about craft that often, although sometimes I do delve into craft, and the person who's supposed to stop me from doing that ain't here. So, <laughs> I'll show him. Yeah. So we got a little a little bit of hiccups we're working on. Seriously, Lee? Oh, wow, that's awesome. Solo is on special. Are we talking like a Kindle Daily Deal or something? I am, uh... I'm very proud of Solo. It was... <laughs> yeah, nothing can stop me now. I'm very proud of Solo, I admit it. Um, I took what I thought was a problem with the script, and I can't fix that, of course. But I put some... I was allowed. It's canon. I was allowed to put some interior monologue and some decision-making in the minds of some characters that make a certain scene make a little bit more sense. Um, I don't know why I'm trying to save you from spoilers, because if you're a Star Wars fan, you will have seen it or will have formed an opinion based on a lot of stupid fanboys and didn't see it. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, Kobo and uh, Kindle looks like. Thank you very much, Lee. I really appreciate you telling me that. So, yeah. Um, so, I know it's a little bit of old news. It's already been fixed, sort of. But it's one of those things where, okay, well, we we covered up that molehill, or we stamped down the molehill. 
What do you do to molehills? Anyway, we took care of the molehill, but we have not dealt with the problem underneath, which is the systemic problem of wanting to sterilize literature, which has a lot of um, sexist and racist and ableist and homophobic roots. So uh, we talk, I talk a lot about on my shows about how representation matters. It's important for, you know, queer people to read books about queer people written by queer people. And the same for, you know, uh, black indigenous people of color or, you know, women or, you know, it's, it's the representation is important. So to back up. There was a site that decided it was going to put ratings on YA, and it sent out emails to a whole bunch of editors and I think maybe agents. I can't remember who uh, put it out on Twitter that they'd gotten this, but they were, um, they're starting this, they, they wanted to do this YA rating system of Everything from, like, chaste kissing is, like, YA1. And then much worse stuff is YA4. And aside from the fact that ever since you could chisel a symbol on a wall, people have been trying to stop kids from reading specific things. And it's, I either don't want to scare them, or I don't want them to learn about homosexuality because then they'll be gay. There's so much logic. I mean, never mind the fact that, you know, kids are going to be gay if they're gay. But the logic there is implies that if kids don't know that you can love someone of a different sex other than the binary, your opposite binary, then they won't feel attraction to their own gender or everybody or what. It's just, mm, makes no sense. So while people pointed out that you can't, you can't do that. You just can't. Kids could find more stuff on AO3 that's hotter and more violent than anything you're trying to police over there in your little YA world. But there's stuff about if you know, I, I follow a lot of black authors, and many say, you know, on their uh, Twitter stream, they'll be like, I talk about politics, because in some people's opinion, my existence is political, so I'm going to talk about politics. So, you know, people are wondering, are where are you going to put, like, race relations? Where are you going to put racism? Because racism is not listed as any of the things that need to be in the higher levels of warnings. So, like, a black kid could pick up a book about chase, with chaste kissing in it and lots of racism, but it's, like, level one. Because it's chaste and clean and racist as hell. Which is not cool. And so, basically, people went to Twitter and the site immediately went down. They're just like, yeah, coming soon. Which is good. They, they learned that you can't do Every once in a while, people try to do this. And I want to tell you what a dead white guy said about this. I studied John Milton in college, and I loved it because I had a teacher who loved Milton. He was brilliant, and he managed to get the whole class really, really into John Milton. And while... His shit is dense. His poems are fine. Poems are lovely. But, you know, when you get into his political writings, it's so dense. And I've tried to reread Arapagitica, which is what I'm going to be talking about. And it's really hard because his sentences are just, like, super long. It's almost like stream of consciousness. But I'm going to tell you what Arapagitica is. Milton got... Uh, censored for writing about divorce because he either wanted a divorce or couldn't get a divorce. 
I'll bring up a point about Milton history in a moment. Milton is a lot. Kids are asleep, definitely. Um, but after it was censored, he wrote Arapagitica, which is his anti-censorship pamphlet. And it has lots and lots of arguments that should be brought up today. Now, remember, Milton was heavily religious. But Milton's concept is, if you do not expose yourself to sin, like you see sin, you know what sin is, you process it and you understand it, and then you say no, that person is more pure, is, is better, a better person than someone who's completely innocent, who's never, ever seen the sin. And I'm using sin because, you know, that's what they were talking about, blasphemous, whatever, against the church. But it goes to anything you don't want your kids to see. An idea you don't want your kids to know about. A lifestyle that you don't want your kids to know about or, God forbid, a, you know, make part of your uh, their lifestyle. But it's also not trusting kids or adults, anybody, because when you see the thing and you understand the thing and you process the thing and you make your own decision on the thing, you will be better off. It's like walling off a field and telling kids, don't go in the field. Why not? Don't go in the field. Don't go in the field. They're, of course, going to want to go in the field. And guess what? There are monsters in the field, and they get eaten by the monsters. This is my world. Let me have it. So if they'd said, don't go in the field because monsters will eat you. There are large monsters with tentacles and lots of teeth. I recommend you not going over there. Here's a picture of the monster. Don't go over there. Listen, can you hear the monster? That, that growling and slavering and all that, that's, that's what it wants. It wants to eat you. Don't do it. When you know enough to make your own decision about something, then you understand it better. And maybe you can understand, perhaps you agree with your parents that this is a terrible thing. But you can make your own decision based on it. I am, of course, kind of moving aside, like, super graphic violence and sex, which usually doesn't come in YA at all. So, and it's funny because the people who write these kinds of ratings, I'm sure are the kind of people that, when people bring up content warnings, they call them snowflakes. And content warnings are better than ratings because all they do is say... This is in the book. Just letting you know. If this bothers you, you should know it's coming. And you can make your own decision. Again, it's making your own decision. It's processing what's out there. It's getting, it's experiencing something and making decisions based on it. And it took Milton, like, a long time to come to this point because he was very carefully trying not to, you know, get politically assassinated for his outrageous thoughts that maybe if we just didn't suppress writing, people would be better informed and could make their own decisions. So, um, yeah. Milton is a lot. No one else is saying anything. I don't know if I've lost people or what, <laughs> but I feel strongly about Milton, even though, like I said, I've lost my college mindset of being able to parse all of that but every every once in a while I do sit down and try to reread Arapagitica and then I remembered how Milton loves sentences so long my mom told me one day as she was in a, a, a class and her professor did a sentence diagram of the first sentence of Paradise Lost it was a thing It feels like you're listening to a podcast, says Joey. Well, yeah, that's that's what this is. 
Later, it will be. Anyway, the thing is, the funny, very, very annoying thing is, um, I'm not going to tell you the details because they're very boring, but because of some decisions I made about classes before I declared a major, I was not allowed to take the history class that my beloved professor, I, I told you, I love this guy. He, may, he, he could get me excited about Paradise Lost. I mean, he was a wizard. And uh, he taught a class about what was going on at the time about Charles I and Oliver Cromwell and Milton's role in all of that. And I really wanted to take that class and I couldn't because of college bureaucracy and I'd taken too many English classes. No, no, they said, you can't learn. So, um, but interestingly enough, knowing the pol- there's another part I've, I mentioned, I think, yesterday that I wish I'd taken more history because it really does inform writing. I mean, we're going to have an awful lot of authoritarian plague books coming out from this, uh, uh, you know, influenced by the past five years. They're, they're just, they're just going to come. Um, and there's a... In, Invocation to Light at the first part of the third chapter of Paradise Lost where he kind of addresses holy light as a muse. Because, and then, if you know the history, you know, he's blind. He has gone blind. He can't see anymore. And at the time, they thought that the sun's light upon you was God's light, God's eyes upon you. And so, since he helped overthrow the throne... People were saying that God closed his eyes to you. That's why you can't see anymore. And knowing that, it makes that part of Paradise Lost much more powerful because he's invoking the spirit of something he can't, he, he doesn't have access to anymore. I'm getting off topic. I'm just saying that uh, Milton was fascinating. He's also very, very dry. And yeah, although... My teacher even taught Paradise Lost and the fall of Adam and Eve as being somewhat feminist because it takes Eve 400 lines of Paradise Lost to fall, and it takes Adam like 40. So, uh, you know, I appreciated that view of things. When I consider how my light is spent is such a great sonnet, I don't know if I've read that one. That's interesting. I remember we studied um, the Legro and El Penseroso extensively, but not... Um, I don't remember a lot of his sonnets. Yes, Lerota, I know. Milton is a form of torture, but I just... I always think about how he approached censorship as you're keeping us ignorant so and we can't process what you object to in order to make our own decisions and maybe come out better because we kn we knew what was out there and we rejected it. Again, this is more of a moral, religious point of view, but overall it's like you hide something from somebody, that's not going to keep them from it, that's just going to keep them ignorant when they finally learn about it. Um... So yeah, it's, it's, and also the, the, uh, the bits about not making the oppression of minorities one of their hot button topics, which is pretty scary because do they not think that's bad? And I know I'm kind of sounding like this food is terrible and such small portions, but really, if you are going to list all of the objectionable things in YA, and you're not going to address ableism and uh, racism and homophobia and transphobia, then you are, by omission, calling them, calling the people who would experience that pain, you're calling them objectionable. 
Um, so anyway, that's what I think of YA ratings. It's it's hiding stuff from kids never ever works. It doesn't. You know, put it, we still have parental advisory lyrics. Parental, where is it? There it is. The parental advisory stamp. You guys remember that? Remember Tipper Gore? Remember, um, uh, the Ramones wrote a song called Censor Shit that was dedicated to Tipper Gore. And uh, the, the, it said, Tipper, come on. It's, it's just a smokescreen for the real problem. And, uh, yeah, that, that stamp is still there, but I'm not sure it stops anything. The ESRB puts ratings on video games, and parents still complain they're too violent. And I'm like, well, why are your kids playing rated M games? So it's like, it doesn't do anything, except for make certain Puritan mindsets feel accomplished. I was of the other side. I encouraged my kid to read things that sometimes she flat out told me she was not ready for. And no, I'm not like trying to get my kid to read it at age seven, but when her, uh, Attack on Titan was hot and a lot of her friends were reading it and I was uh, attempting to get, get, get a crash course in it because I might have had an opportunity to write a novel in the universe. Obviously, I did not, but I read a lot of Attack on Titan, and I thought she'd like it, but she did not. And I'm like, your friend really likes it. She's like, I'm not ready to read it. I'm like, that's very mature to say you're too immature to read something. Well done. So, uh, yeah, I just let her go at her own speed. And like I said, guys, if your kids have access to the internet, there's so much more on AO3 that they're going to read that... It's just, you might as well stop trying to police books. Because while you're worried about a girl taking off her shirt in a scene of uh, heavy petting, you know, your kid has already read or perhaps written very intense Kirk Spot, Kirk Spot, Kirk Spock slash. It just makes the Puritans feel better. So anyway, what are these? It's like it's been my goal to take Arapagitica and try to translate it into human readable form, but all I got is still the you you take in the thing, you digest it, and you come out better the other side because you have more knowledge and you're you may not be innocent, but your eyes are open to the state of the world, so you can make decisions about what to do about the state of the world, whether you're going to participate or just say no. I think, uh, Kids Are Asleep says, I think some things are worth deplatforming de because they're genuinely poisoned. They're not digestible. I agree. Absolutely. Kids are asleep. Things like, like I mentioned, like super rough, awful gore and sex and violence and misinformation, which is the big problem right now, as we know. Um, I'm more talking about, you know, a kid exploring their sexuality and kissing somebody of the same gender or a kid rejecting uh, both genders. And, you know, some people would think, oh, this is terrible. Oh, kids are going to get ideas from this or learn that there are gay people in the world. And that's, that's more of what I'm talking about is like not awful racist, homophobic disinformation campaign stuff. But thank you for pointing that out, because I am glad I said that. Um, I want to go on a little bit of a tangent here. <laughs> this is one of those things where no one has actually complained. But I was thinking about it this morning, and it made me feel uncomfortable. So um, I got raided on Monday by Space Valkyries, and I really, really like Space Valkyries. Um, I like her her stream, I like her personality, I admire the hell out of her, and it was really, it was surprising and um, just very flattering that she would raid me. I don't get a lot of raids, so I don't have the super smooth introduction that a lot of streamers have. And I said something that I realized could have sounded awful, and I said, I don't make 
I, I can't make, I can't guarantee a safe space, but I can, I make the space as welcoming to everybody as possible. And I realize that sounds like I'm not willing to go further, like to ban bigots or whatever. I totally ban bigots. Um, but being white, cis, able-bodied American, I mean, there are things I cannot do just because of who I am. For example, there are, uh, at a lot of conventions, usually smaller conventions, there's a people of color dinner where a lot of professionals who are not white get together and go out to dinner. And there are white liberal friends who are like, hey, wait a minute, I, I'm not a racist, can't I come? And they're like, no, because it changes the dynamic to have someone white there and we would like to not have that just this time. And white liberals don't want to hear that, but it's the truth. It's like, I can't make a 100% safe space because there's a possibility I could screw something up simply because I am not gay, I am not a person of color. So in the fact that I said I can't make a safe space, that's what I meant. Not that I'm not willing to ban anybody who causes any uh, trouble in chat. So I don't know if anybody got that or thought the wrong thing, but I just wanted to make that clear because uh, I just try to understand that a lot of these prejudices are systemic. I benefit from them. I'm trying to address my privilege and do what I can to help out um, where I can boost and not over talk. So um, that's, that's what I meant. Uh, hey T, good to see you. Uh, it's an onto sentiment and you're still newish at streaming. You can always develop a scripted greeting or find a way to greet people that is truly yours, so long as the greeting is sincere. It took a long time before I stumbled on the Twitch dad greeting, and that's all thanks to Markiplier. Sounds like a brain weasel has been gnawing at you about this. Interestingly, just this morning, the Rhoda, I was, I was thinking about uh, how sweet it was that, that she raided me, and I realized I just told everyone coming in that this wasn't a safe space. And I didn't say it like that, but... I just try to be honest and know that, that I can't offer an LGBT friendly stream because I am not LGBT. I, and I've heard people talk about their problems with like allies saying, or accomplices. I, anyway, whatever your preferred word is, but, um, straight people trying to say that they're friendly to other, uh, society other people but if you tag yourself lgbtq then people see that as you are of my group and that is a little bit uh dishonest so that's that's why oh i am an ally just some people think that ally is not active enough and accomplice is better because there, there's a lot of, again, I think it might be the whole white liberal, I'll support you so long as you're nice to me kind of thing. Um, you know, people who drop allyship because a black person made them angry. It's That's not an ally at all. Um, hey, Devo Spice. Anyway, um, this is just my personal comfort zone. I don't want to pretend to be anything I'm not, and I want to tell people I will make a welcoming, as much of a welcoming space as I have power to do. Um, that's all. That's all I'm trying to say. Anyway. Um, so something came up in the Discord, and I won't mention the person. If they want to bring it, bring themselves up in the chat, that's fine. Um, but... In leading, in, in discussing uh, the leaving of an agent, they went into detail about what the agent wanted them to change about their manuscript. Now, when I've been asked to change manuscripts, it's like, this person doesn't have enough agency. This person, uh, I don't understand their motivations here. Um, again, doing the systemic thing that I don't know about because I'm... I'm of a privileged position. I, um, 
I had a black woman die and in the realm of where I was doing it, you know, my age is just like, I'm not crazy about this character being black and being the first one to die. And I'm like, oh shit, you're right. And so I'm, I'm glad she caught me on that. Um, and those are the things that Jen would catch. She would catch, you know, you need to have, this person needs to really know what they're doing. I want to know what the feelings are in this novel. She was big on, on making sure, like, something happens, what does the character feel about that? And you got to weave that in well. You can't just, like, say, I feel sad I killed that person. But the, uh, the discussion of what this author said was the agents wanted them to take out wine drinking, erase three characters, um, really omit the Oxford comma, parentheticals. I can't remember it all. I can look it up. But um, it's... It's like, that's this author's voice. That is how they write. I mean, Terry Pratchett did the same thing. Terry Pratchett had no chapters. He did asides and footnotes all the damn time. And you know when you pick up, I mean, if you are well-read in Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman, you can find out the parts of Good Omens that was written by Pratchett and the parts that were written by Gaiman. It's pretty obvious because we know those writers' voices. And their voice has remained consistent. And what it sounded like this agent was trying to do was make this author's voice more like what they wanted a voice to be. And I've talked about voice a little bit, but it's because... Well, mostly in the way that it confuses me. Honestly, because I... um. I can't hear my own voice. It's like you can't hear your own accent. And I can't look at a page of my work and say, well, it's very clear I wrote this. Um, but other people say, you know, they like my voice, so that's that's nice. It's it's apparently I have one. <laughs> so that's good. But I can't see it. But in talking to this author, it's like you what they wanted to erase sound a lot like the way this author writes, which is not okay. You know, telling you what plot parts don't work if your story skews into a not good uh, depiction of a marginalized person or, you know, suggesting you get a sensitivity reader or anything like that. That is wanting to make your book better. But things like I don't like the way you use commas and parentheticals. That's that's at the core. That's that's core problems with the person's voice and sometimes it's hard to hear what when you get an edit letter. It's always hard to hear even though it's not even a rejection, but it is a, the baby you sent me has some flaws. But you need to be able to step back and look at the edits suggested and see if what they're trying to do is reasonable for the sake of the story or ha they are the kind of awful person you sometimes encounter in publishing who wants your book to be more like what they want if they were writers, which they're not. So um, I'm really glad this person shared that because it was, uh, it reminded me to talk about your voice because it's so hard. I, I don't know if anybody else can do it. If you know your own voice in chat, great. Speak up. I'll be very impressed, but I'm not. I can't hear it. And all I know is I've tried to suppress my southern accent for so long, it's hard for me to actually do a southern accent. Unless I get angry or drunk, apparently, according to people close to me. And then the drawl comes out. So, that's not a challenge, by the way. 
Uh, going back to the ally thing, I don't feel comfortable labeling myself ally or accomplice. Something in the marginalized group is free to give me that compliment, but I can only demonstrate it, not declare it. Yeah, no, Bill, same here. I don't, I don't tag myself as anything. I just try to tell people, as you've seen in the chat going by, you are welcome if you are X, and you are not welcome if you're Y. Y being intolerant or doing saying cruel things or trying to play it off as a joke. Um, T has tagged myself with both ally and LGBTQI plus tag, and no one's called me out. I've got the tags out there as a welcome mat. Guess I should be careful. And some people do see it that way. Um, the the streamers that I follow who've been the biggest uh, influence on me um, are of the most of them are in the Rainbow Arcade, um, which is a, a gay Twitch team. And uh, many of them are also non-white, so I've heard about it from their points of view. But there are lots of people out there, so, um, you know, I, I see what you're saying, and I would like to do it too, to, to, to say this is a welcoming stream, but it's not, uh, you know, you can say in your chat rules or in your information, you know, I, here we believe Black Lives Matter, trans rights are human rights, etc., that's a welcome mat as well. I take the label Dragon Dad because uh, that's me, father and LGBTQ offspring. Okay, what's the Dragon Nobilis? Because I've heard, uh, I have a friend with a Mama Bear uh, t-shirt with like big old Mama Bear protecting little rainbow cubs, um, which I really, really love. Oxford, comma, la gasp, yes. Hey, Will, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, when I started listening to I Should Be Writing in Ditch Diggers, I was surprised how inclusive you and Matt were, and it made me think that I was so used to people not liking me because of being queer. So when things are welcoming, it always surprises me. Oh, Will, that's very sweet and sad. I'm sorry. But yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, Joey can hear sleeping doggo. Yes, he's he's a snorer. Um, no one's paid the price, but I'll turn on doggo anyway because I want to. Let me get that angled correctly. Yeah, the, the PC's in the way. Sorry about that. Uh, we wanted it not under the desk so it wouldn't be so loud. But now doggo is very large. Shrink doggo. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not what I wanted to do either. There. There's doggo, doggo cam. And PC cam. Sorry. Ursula and her edits. Yes, Ursula will often chronicle her copy edits on Twitter. It's uh, I would never want to be her copy editor just because I would not want to see that. Standard English, according to some standard or other, raises many other ways of speaking. Yeah, um, Annie Belay was saying on Twitter that uh, especially if you're writing in first person uh, point of view you should not be called on any grammatical errors because that's you're, you're doing a specific person's voice not an English teacher's unless the person is an English teacher <laughs> just thought of the, the scene in the office where Phyllis is like yeah this is the Moroccan Christmas party we're doing this this and this it's not your grandmother's Christmas party Unless she's Moroccan, and then it's very, very on point. Uh, two reasons an agent might suggest changes. One is to make it a better story, the other to make it easier to sell. That's true. If you write a cozy mystery and the hero swears all the way through it, they're going to have a hard time selling it, and we'll advise you to change that. I I had a friend in uh, my grad school program who wanted to write a fucking cozy. That's what he called it. He wanted to write fucking cozies. And we had a guest lecturer in who did not really hit it off with the uh with the folks with the, with the people um because yeah they were not impressed with her just saying flat out that you know cozies don't have swearing and you know i know there are genre rules like i've talked about the mystery rules many times and then there are the rules of uh then there are all the rules that Agatha Christie said and then immediately broke. 
almost like she was doing a, a challenge for herself. But yeah, it it seems. I suppose they 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 put. If you want to write a mystery with swearing, that's like noir or crime or something. So I don't know. I've got like. I don't know if you can call my books space cozies, but they have swearing. Uh, an editor, oh, trying to imagine someone telling Douglas Adams or Terry Pratchett, hey, could you take out all these parentheticals and footnotes? They're cluttering up the page and breaking the flow. Exactly. Man, the, the footnotes were the best part of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. No, it was all the best part, but it was a good part. An editor should make the story best version of itself, not force it to be something else, indeed. Developing a voice in any creative endeavor, writing, art, podcasting is hard, but if you can defend it, I think it's worth having that discussion with agents or editors. Yes. Um, they have a vested interest in selling it. That's how they make their money. Sure. And they can, but you know, it's like the, there's the, you choose the hill you want to die on. If you think they're changing your sto your voice too much, you can speak up and say no. And then they can say Okay, we won't publish it. Either give us our advance money back or we'll uh, give us another book. It's like that they can't force you to change your voice and put the book out. But you may have to make a difficult decision. Dragon Dad has is a huge Facebook group. Uh, Cheryl had a similar edition, issue with an editor. Hey, Cheryl, have I said hey to you? I can't remember. Good to see you. I handed in the manuscript and letter to a writer friend to see if it was off. I was off base. We both agreed while the editor had good points, they were off base on more issues. Um, not sure if the label is particularly well known in LGBT circles, but if folks ask if it could be an opportunity to start a conversation about the importance of parental support for LGBT folks, yes. <clears throat> you have paid the tie, thank you, kids are asleep, and the sleeping doggo thanks you too. There would definitely be a market for a fucking cozy, but it would be smaller. <laughs> I would so read a fucking cozy. A friend of mine wants me to write cosmic horror cozies where Hastur, while going about his business, solves mysteries involving cosmic horrors. You know, I, for some reason, um, I, I don't know how much in the weeds to get with this. Uh, if you've the Running Adventure Godmaker on Zombies Run is uh, came from a sort of dark fantasy that I tried to sell a couple of years ago, and my agent couldn't get on board, and uh, I couldn't make it something she'd want to sell. So um, that was the point where I said okay, and I came up with another book. Um, but it had in it, I was trying to make Pinkie Pie from My Little Pony an assassin. I was trying to make someone who was just, she was good at her job, she loved her job, and she was friendly. And, um, couldn't sell that. I was also making interior designers assassins, because you let them into your house. Kind of like bards, you know, you get a bard, it's a party, yay, and then the bard can just slip off and kill somebody. That fits in, like, D&D &D and stories, but the interior designers, not so much. But that's where the god of laundry and vengeance came from, which I did keep in the running story, because the godmaker had made a little idol of laundry and vengeance. Hi, Triffid. Good to see you. I'm a newspaper editor. I apply very different standards to news articles and people's own columns. We standardize news articles, news styles for reason of its columns, and fiction ought to have their individual voices. Exactly. When you're writing for a newspaper there's the standard you're presenting as part of the newspaper. When you're writing something that's very clearly from your own voice, an opinion column, um, or if you just have a column about gardening or board games, or gardening and board games, I would read that, um, then your own voice fits. Fiction, your own voice fits. Creative nonfiction, your own voice fits, unless you're... I don't know, T might be able to speak up to this, uh... Unless you're doing, like, a dummies book, but then that's... I wouldn't call that creative nonfiction. I'm not sure. Because you... you I know you had a standard you had to follow for the dummies books. 
Uh, T. Morris, uh, the Team Monster in chat, is uh, the author of Podcasting for Dummies and Twitch for Dummies. Other doggo is using a mic stand for a pillow, and I don't see how that's comfortable. But she's happy. Um, yes, yeah, so I forgot to do what Matt always does, which is um, take the go to Twitter and ask, ha ha, I found the thing to change it and make it better. Um, okay, I fixed this. This is totally what you should be doing to fixing your things on live on stream. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I did not ask Twitter if they had any Ditch Diggers questions, if y'all have any more questions, or we can just chat. Because I'm... Yeah, I'm here streaming and chatting. I, uh, If I have the time and spoons, I will be streaming Tharsis later today. Um, because I want to play Tharsis. And a friend of mine who came in at the end of the Dream Daddy stream on Monday um, really wants to see me play Tharsis. He didn't believe me when I told him the first time I streamed Tharsis I actually won just fine. Uh, Cozy is um, a mystery book, usually a murder mystery, but it's it's if you see like the, the mysteries created around puns about cupcakes or like there's a probably a bakery set of mysteries and the covers are always really homey. It's just, it's about a murder mystery. Um, I suppose today the Miss Marple books by Agatha Christie might be considered cozies. Um, if anybody else knows how to better explain cozies, um, speak up in chat, but it's, it's just supposed to be a like, Murder, she wrote. It's just a friendly little voice, a friendly little book, uh, almost exclusively about women, I think. And there's usually something that you... that the stories revolve around so it can be in a series. So, like, a bakery or a knitting uh, class or knitting school or... And then they, they take the um, then they take the story, they take the title and make it a pun, which hurts my head. Uh, and Cozy's do not have a detective or cop as the main character. That's true. It's usually, uh, an amateur sleuth for Cozy's. They have a pet. The cat or dog is really important. Thank you, Ansela. Okay, so I don't have, my character does not have a pet. Huh. She is accompanied by two very large, compared to our b bugs, not like large as in compared to humans, but uh, very large sentient wasps, but that's not something she wants to be done. Yeah. Knitting, baking, arts and crafts are usually involved. The Aurora Tea Garden books, the cat, yeah, the cat who came in books. So, um... Yes, there are swarms of sentient in insects who have a literal hive mind in my book. And they have taken interest in my main character. Uh, so that's all I have on my list. I'm quite enjoying the supernatural cozies. It's like a cozy, but they're witches or cuddly vampires. Would you call the Sookie Stackhouse books cozies? I think I've only read two of them. And I didn't like them as much as True Blood. I usually don't try to put down writers' books here, but on the other hand, Charlene Harris will have to work hard to hear me through the walls of money she has built around herself from the Sookie Stackhouse and True Blood experience. So I think she's okay. My next work in progress is a fantasy cozy. Awesome. Actually, uh, Val, is your would you uh, call your books space cozies? 
I've never read Sookie Stackhouse, sorry. Never saw the show. True Blood was good up to a point where I stopped watching. But um, after reading, watching True Blood, I tried to read Sookie Stackhouse. And sometimes Hollywood people take out people's favorite parts and put in their own, and it's awful. And sometimes they take out weak parts of a story and either leave them out or put them in um, a different way. Also, True Blood followed a lot of characters, which, you know, you could do a book that's first person, but it's really hard to do an only for first person movie. You're going to see scenes with all sorts of different people. Called Lucifer a cozy. Okay, a cozy with a sex drive. <laughs> Lucifer is more of a police procedural. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I love the concept of Sookie Stackhouse. I just didn't think... Yeah. Like I said, I don't like shitting on other authors' books, but there's some... <laughs> I'll say I don't like shitting on my peers' books. How's that? Charlene Harris is not my peer. Definitely, definitely not. She is very much uh, above me. With experience and success and uh, number of books. I would call the Suki books on the edge. They're cozy elements, but she's often taken out of her hometown and dealing with unknown to her people and places. That's true. The town has a place in a cozy, doesn't it? It's usually small and friendly. and Some romance authors have uh, taken to filling a town full of single people and then dedicating different books to different couples. And then the couple who got together in book one will be supporting characters in book two as another couple tries to get together. I have not really been into reading that many uh, Christmas stories. Or no, ah, I'm thinking ahead and saying what I'm thinking to say after this, and then I lost what I was going to say. I have not read full series of romances in that vein, but considering for some reason... I love Christmas romances. I don't want just a regular romance. I want one that, that, that has Christmas in it and Christmas is saved. That's a key point. Um, so I've read Christmas stories within that structure and you can tell it's like, oh, this couple got, the, she's referencing them as if they were the stars of another book. It's a, uh, but but yeah, they usually don't do it in a way that leaves um, leaves you wondering. It, it's hard to write in a series and pick up, tell someone they could pick up a book anywhere. It took me several seasons before I realized it should have been weird that Lucifer and his brother uh, have different accents. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I've gotten to that point. I have a question, says Will. I was asked to submit a story for a guest editor who requests works from queer uh, BIPOC backgrounds. So my question is, uh, I look white and feel like I shouldn't send in the story. Thoughts anyone? I am... I am white and can only tell you what I've read from other... Uh, authors but you are who you are regardless of how you look Tobias Bakel also looks very white again I'm, I'm treading carefully here because my advice is not not where you should end it's where you should begin how's that I've heard other authors say you know I may be called not black enough or whatever but they did identify as because of their you know, parents. So yeah, I would, I would check out his blog and like, look for, I think he's written about this before the, the, the racial issues he has to deal with. Check out at least Toby. Yeah. Don't, don't self reject on that. Will you know who you are? And also the editor asked you, so 
you know, it's not even like the editor's gonna say, no, nah, man, you're white, clearly. It's, you, you've got the editor's support, so that should be the biggest green light, but if you want to read more about what other people have uh, dealt with regarding this, I would start with Toby Buckell. Let me see if I can find his link. I love Toby. He is awesome. Toby does magical things and has ADHD, and I beg him for his secrets, and he gives them to me, and I still can't cope. <laughs> so clearly the problem's with me. Uh, what am I doing? Trying to enjoy, imagine a cozy Christmas assassin romance. Now, tree lobsters, I believe those have been done. Maybe I'm just thinking bounty hunter, not assassin. I'm thinking Bounty Hunter. There are a lot of really bad Christmas movies. Last year, I went way, way ahead of my... Um, I, I, I... What is it? Your grasp outstretched your reach, or your reach outstretched your grasp? I don't know. Essentially, I went way too ambitious for the following I had on Twitch, and it was... It crashed and burned, but I tried to meld the new watch a movie with me Twitch feature with my love of Christmas movies, but also my criticism of Christmas movies. And I made out bingo cards and I wore Christmas pajamas and I invited Grant Bachoco to join me on the Emmett Otter and Jug Band Christmas uh scene because Grant is a puppeteer and has worked with Henson. So who better to comment on Emmett Otter than him in the circles that I have. So, and yeah, we, it's like, I had one, I can't remember who it was, but if he's still listening, I still treasure you. I had one person join me on one of the streams and halfway through, I realized they were in Europe and couldn't see the movie because it was limited to U.S. release on Amazon Prime. So they were just hanging out to keep me company, and they could not see the movie. <laughs> oh, God, it was awful. Yes, Christmas movie bingo cards. Like, um, God, Secret Sibling... Um, dying, someone's dying, Santa is real, someone related to Santa, uh, God, I can't remember all of them. They, we had, we had a list, a really long list of things that appear in a lot of Christmas movies and just tried to, uh, Santa is real, magic is real, um, absolutely cardboard evil villain. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was fun to make up the cards and it was fun to buy the Christmas pajamas and it was fun to watch the movies, even though I was alone. Um, uh, actually Numbers Ninja joined me for, um, our watching of Anna and the Apocalypse. That was fun. But yeah, Grant and I, I'm not sure if anybody watched Jug Bang Christmas with us. And I did a couple of other movies, but I eventually just fizzled because I was not getting any traction at all. Gift of the Magi. Yes, if if they use the Gift of the Magi, uh, you know, giving people crappy gifts. What's funny is I'd never thought of this because I grew up with Emma Daughter, but the first time I showed it to my husband, he was an adult, and he's like, that movie's terrible. It's like Gift of the Magi, but worse. Because, I mean, spoiler, <laughs> feel weird spoiling a 35-year-old failed Muppet Christmas special. Um, yes, they're, they're, the, the otters are very poor, and Emmett, they're, they're both, they don't realize, they're both trying to be in a talent show to win money to buy the other one a present. But in order to do so... They, they destroy each other's only ways of making money. So she does laundry. He puts a hole in her wash tub to make a wash tub base. He does odd jobs around the, the neighborhood, and she sells the tool chest to get fabric for her gown to sing on stage. So it's like, even it's worse than Gift to the Magi. 
<laughs> so uh, I never even realized that as a kid. But everything's okay in the end because it's Christmas and Christmas is saved. Um. Oh, also, Will, uh, congratulations on getting uh, solicited for a story. That's that's a big deal. That's awesome. Um, yeah, if anybody else has thoughts, let me know. But uh, I really don't think you should self-reject, especially if they approached you, because that's really cool. I'm very happy for you. Uh, with Kurt Russell, you need Sexy Santa. Oh, yeah, Sexy Santa. Um... I've done horrible things to Santa in some of my stories. Turned him into a zombie in one. Drove him mad by seeing Cthulhu in another. Nice. I like it. I tried to... Uh, I tried to set the devil on the world because Zuzu's bell at the end of It's a Wonderful Life, every time a bell wing rings, an angel gets his wings. Her bell actually gave Lucifer wings. And so he set out to destroy the world. It was a hundred word story and, and it it failed and then some people were trying to set, some people took from it that it was a redemption story for Lucifer and now he's an angel. And I'm like, no, no, that's not, that's not what I intended. It was more of a horror thing, but okay. You get you people are gonna get what they get out of your stories, and you can't control it. Um. Hey, Saria, good to see you. Primalina agrees. Don't self reject. You are legit. Uh, thanks for dropping by, Primalina. It's good to see you. Yes, I uh. I have posted this, but I'm posting it again because uh, my moderator is available for commissions, and we have I have two new emojis, uh, Evil Mer and No Numbers Ninja. That's uh, the orange hair is Numbers Ninja. So, if you look closely, Evil Mer has a mustache. Oh, hey, Gabriel. Good to see you. Um, so yeah, I might release the bingo cards this year if anybody wants, if anybody enjoys Christmas movies and wants a bingo card to play with. So, uh, oh, thank you, the Rhoda. Oh, Val, I thought you were my friend. Anyway, uh, upcoming for me, tomorrow I'll be doing the first, uh, of probably many I Should Be Writings about NaNoWriMo. If you're a long-time listener, you probably will have heard it all before, but I think people just like the encouragement, because I'm pretty sure I got nothing else to say about this, but people still want the encouragement, and I am here to encourage. So uh, we'll be talking about NaNoWriMo tomorrow. Uh, next week, I'm going to have Gwenda Bond on. I'm excited about this. Gwenda Bond wrote Not Your Average Hot Guy. Speaking of Lucifer, we've mentioned him several times in several different uh mediums media several different media this is about a woman who uh falls in love with the son of the devil and apparently averts the apocalypse i have not gotten to that part yet but um gwenda will be on the show on i should be writing next week so looking forward to that i'm planning on trying again this year for nano uh yes that is awesome i am too trying to Going to try Nano this year. Um, Longtime audience members will also know that that is usually a crash and burn experience for me. But um, doggos are treated, and uh, but you know, I it's never a failure because if you write more trying to do Nano than you would have otherwise in November, you still end up end up you're still ahead. So that's, that's what I tell myself. Oh, there we go. Good doggo. Treat. Yes, he's very happy. All right. Well, I remember that I have a lunch date, so I should probably go and get ready. But uh, if anyone wants a fun cozy mystery, try Death in Castle Sark by Veronica Bond. Thank you, Will. 
Uh, I might do micro read day where I try to write 5,000 words in one day. Ouch. That just makes my wrists hurt. Um, like I said, if you followed, you'll get the notice, but I will probably be streaming Tharsis, a resource management spaceship to Mars, and you may eat your crew if you don't have enough food kind of game. I'll be streaming that later uh, today. Yeah, Novembers are bad for me, too. They usually end up being, like, I'm mid-project, and I have book two of the Midsolar Murders to start soon, so, um, uh, yeah. I think if I do daily stuff for NaNoWriMo, I am going to be preloading, front-loading it, because I always run out of steam when I have to do both, um, like, trying to write NaNoWriMo and try to produce content for y'all. So, we'll see how that works out. But, anyway, thank you very much for being here. Going to see who we can raid. Uh, appreciate everybody hanging out and uh, giving me your attention and your uh, just friendliness. Words are hard, okay? I'm just... I still feel like I'm struggling in different ways. Space Valkyries is online and Space Valkyries is awesome. So um, thank you all for coming. You can support us at patreon.com slash mighty myrrh. Ditch Diggers! Theme song by Devo Spice, devospice.com.